Kelly Miller Smith was born on October 28, 1920, in the all-black town of Mound Bayou, Mississippi. He graduated from Morehouse College in 1942 and earned a Master's of Divinity from Howard University in 1945. Growing up in Mississippi automatically involves one in the civil rights effort one way or the other. You, you don't ignore it, in other words. In 1951, he arrived in Nashville as pastor for the First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. He later formed the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference in 1958. Through the NCLC, he sponsored workshops used to train community members in the ways of nonviolent protest. They were having some role playing. And in some of the scenes, you almost cried. Jim Lawson, well, Jim was extremely important to us in, in what happened here because Jim was really the only person who was not a neophyte in this matter of nonviolence. He, he lived it and believed it. It was his true philosophy. He had uh, spent some time in India and so forth. Jim came to me one time, and I was, I was president of the organization, and asked, uh, what about getting some students to become involved in this? I told him I thought it would be a very good idea. He said, he said so we'll do a little recruiting. And so uh, the students became very interested and outnumbered the adults uh, quickly and easily, and uh, became part of the workshops, training, and uh, the sit-ins actually became a student to fair. The NCLC began their first sit-ins in February of 1960. It was met with trouble, violence, and arrests. Why? I asked myself, why? What have I done? Why is this to me? It was a feeling that never could be expressed by anyone unless it was unless it happened to them the things that happened here in nashville during the past several months kept to mature these students i heard some of them speak of how they sat at a lunch counter and suddenly grew up because things began to take on meaning for them they their lives began to take on a note of seriousness and and suddenly they began to uh, get some grasp of the meaning of life itself. They began to get some feel of the fact that a person ought to have a cause for which he can give himself and a cause which will outlast his own living. I was sitting there demanding a God-given right and my soul became satisfied that I was right in what I was doing at the same time, was something deep down within me, moving me, that I could no longer be satisfied or go along with an evil system, that I had to be maladjusted to it. And in spite of all of this, I had to keep loving the people who denied me service. Freedom now, I think, has to be the goal of anybody who uh, is sincere. And the struggle. He was the chairman of the NCLC's negotiations committee. They attempted to negotiate with merchants to desegregate lunch counters and restrooms and to change their hiring practices. To sit there and to try to get, get together on something is a rough experience, but uh, it was through the negotiations, uh, of course, coupled with the openings that came from the demonstrations that we were able to, uh, to get a crack in the wall. To be successful in negotiations, he learned that he had to try as best he could to sit in the other man's shoes. Now one of the things we had to learn as negotiators is that you've got to try to, as best you can, try to understand his point of view, even though you don't agree with it. And this, this is terribly important. Well, it's just not the things we're used to down here. I mean, they come in, 
and they sit down, and, and we're not used to them sitting down beside us, because I wasn't raised with them. I never have lived with them, and I'm not going to start now. It's, it's a tremendous thing to sit there with a group of people who, who uh, you come from two entirely different worlds. Uh, you don't speak the same language, and uh, they perhaps have never seen Negroes close up except as janitors and maids, never talked across a table on an equal level. You've got to overcome this kind of barrier. They ask me some pretty soul-searching questions. And one that was addressed to me as a man, and I tried the be as best I could to answer it, frankly and honestly, that I could not agree that it was morally right for someone to sell them merchandise and refuse them service. And I had to answer it just exactly that way. During the weeks after the sit-ins began, opposition in the white communities of the South solidified, and the first signs of violence appeared. Those few whites who sympathized publicly with the sit-ins soon found themselves to be prime targets. The idea of integration was considered a ridiculous and frivolous joke by his counterparts. I'm sorry, our management does not allow us to serve niggers in here. Nevertheless, Kelly Miller Smith's ideal and strategy was to always aim for the moon with their requests. We want everything right now. We used to go down here and talk to these people, and uh, always I would start, to, you know, whenever I had the opportunity to start it, I would start the conference by saying, we would like to have your business desegregated by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, since you're closing uh, within a few minutes today. And Nashville became the first major city in the South to permit whites and Negroes to eat together in public places. The Nashville settlement was studied closely by other communities. By midsummer, a total of 27 cities had opened their lunch counters to all customers. There have been no disorders as a result, and none of the merchants affected has reported any loss in business. But the chain reaction started by the sit-ins is far from complete. In the winter and early spring of 1960, the efforts of Nashville's Negro College students had led to the integration of lunch counters at six department and variety stores. But they were still excluded from eating at the city's downtown drug stores and restaurants, train depot, and a bus terminal. And on November 2nd, only a few weeks ago, they began to march downtown again to launch a new round of sit-ins that are still going on. We held our heads high because we were right, and we knew we were walking for something right. We were really striding towards freedom. It was a wonderful feeling. It was magnificent. We felt unity. We felt power. We felt strength. My statement has always fallen on very unsympathetic ears when I say that no amount of progress is satisfactory because progress suggests process. It suggests a piecemeal kind of thing and none of that is really satisfactory. Uh, what we want is not progress, we want complete freedom. We want everything right now. 